Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just uh, one more minute and uh, welcome uh, to uh, this uh, event. Uh, for us, this is a celebration of the Human Rights Day event from human rights on paper to practice implementing sexual and reproductive health laws. Thank you. And uh, I would li like to ask your patience. Uh, we will start in one minute. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, again. Uh, I would like to um, w welcome you today to uh, this event. And uh, we were just working, waiting to make sure that all the panelists uh, are connected. And uh, happy uh, Human Rights Day. Of course, it was uh, a couple of days ago, but it was a Saturday. Uh, so we saw that we will wait today to have uh, you know more people uh, on uh, connected in that very important conversation. Uh, so it is my pleasure to welcome you to this United Nations Population Fund event on the occasion of the Human Rights Day. Uh, my name is uh, Nafisa Tujob and I'm the Chief of the Gender and Human Rights Branch uh, here at UNFPA in New York. And uh, this uh, branch is uh, located into uh, the technical division. So into the event from human rights on paper to practice implementing sexual and reproductive health laws will be about you know, how we move human rights from paper, of course, to practice as the title is indicating. And it's uh, so important because we all know, uh, you know that uh, uh, the ICPD program of action uh, adopted in 1994 by 179 member states put the rights of individual human beings especially women and girls at the center of sustainable development. But more than two decades on, while the program of action has shown positive changes, too many people are still being left behind. So we want to hear and discuss today how sexual and reproductive health law, respectful of human rights can be strengthened, implemented, and how we can address and repeal those laws that are discriminatory. So uh, I would like to start by saying that we are going to uh, use, of course, uh, an evidence-based approach uh, today uh, to this uh, discussion. So as research uh, shows, the existence of a supporting law, supportive law doesn't necessarily translate into the provision of services, nor does it ensure that services are accessible for the population who need them most. To shed light on this, we will listen to experiences from different sectors, like at academia, civil society, and particularly government. And thank you so much for the government of uh, Colombia, for the my, vice minister to join us today in this conversation. So I'm sure that this variety of perspective will enrich our understanding and contribute deeply to the solutions we can think to make human rights a reality across the world. But also the conversation today give us the opportunity to make visible new global data available on sexual and reproductive health laws collected under the SDG indicator 5.62. So this indicator measure laws and regulations that guarantee men and women full and equal access to sexual and reproductive health care and information. We will see uh, you know, uh, um, how uh, these findings can help us guide countries in acting more on the information uh, that the, uh, the data are providing. So I would like to just uh, uh, you know, introduce the panelists and uh, it's my deep honor to count on the participation today of uh, Ms. Jenny Keita, the Deputy Executive Director of Programs of UNFPA, 
and I would like to thank her because we were in the 60 days of activism and she has been there every day with us in all events, putting as a priority in her agenda. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Jeannie, again. Dr. Jamie Urego, Vice Minister of Public Health of Colombia. Dr. Richard Snow, Chief of Population and Development Branch at UNFPA, my dear colleague. Uh, Dr. Jinan Liman, Associate Professor in Public Law of the Faculty of Legal, Political and Social Science in Tunis, Tunisia. Uh, Mrs. Fatia Kiyange, Executive Director of the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development in Uganda. Dr. Laura Ferguson of the University of Southern California in the United States. And Mrs. Bandana Rana of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. So thank you so much, all the panelists, for joining. And uh, now, without further ado, let me introduce you to Ms. Jenny Keita, our uh, Deputy Executive Director and Assistant, uh, Sec uh, Assistant Deputy Secretary General, <coughs> sorry, of the United Nations. So thank you so much, Jenny. And over to you. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Nafi. Um, Excellence, Excellentissimo Vice Minister of Public Health of Colombia, Dr. Jaime Urego, esteemed panelists, partners, and colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. You all know that famous song from Bob Marley, get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. It's an honor for me and a pleasure to join you all in commemoration of International Human Rights Day. This year, all of us at the United Nations Population Fund applaud the strides that many countries are making in enacting laws and regulations that guarantee full and equal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Thank you to all of you. However, it is vital that we remember the many challenges uh, before us. The continued impact of COVID-19, ongoing conflicts in many parts of the world, and the precarious nature of the global economy underscore the fragility of the recent gain that have been made in advancing the rights of women and girls especially in terms of their dignity, bodily autonomy, integrity, and choice. Last month, the world marked the 8 billion moment. And as our executive director, Dr. Natalia Kanem, has highlighted, all 8 billion people alive today should enjoy all human rights as defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as other international agreement and national laws. That's why today conversation is very, very critical and very grateful to all our panelists because in practically every part of the world, there is a progress to be made in achieving SDG target 5.6 on universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And also to achieve progress, it is vital that we have strong international human rights laws, national laws, and local legislation that can provide a shield against harmful norms and practices, discrimination and violence. Esteemed participant, we know that some law can help support bodily autonomy by guaranteeing everyone's access to sexual and reproductive health services, mandating schools to provide comprehensive sexuality education, and requiring informed consent in the provision of health care. Likewise, some, some laws can also be particularly important in mitigating the impact of the opposition to SRHR and others are crucial in upholding 
confidentiality and service for HIV treatment. However, we know that laws can also be used to limit access to life-saving sexual and reproductive service. And there are discriminatory regulations that prevent individuals from making their own decision about their sexual and reproductive health and rights. I am proud to share that UNFPA, through our custodian role of SDG indicator 5.6.2, an indicator that measures laws and regulations that guarantee men and women's full and equal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, we have created the first comprehensive global assessment of legal frameworks with data on 153 countries, which covers 89% of the world's population. And in our role in collecting data and advancing research on the laws that empower and control bodily autonomy, it is one of our critical contribution to advancing action and accountability. This data can support government and civil society to better understand to the extent to which their laws support bodily autonomy and where legal gaps and barriers exist. We are also advancing action-oriented result uh, research to support countries in identifying the main obstacles for implementing sexual and reproductive health laws repealing discriminatory laws and implementing supportive laws to ensure that we move from human rights on paper to human rights in practice, that we walk the talk. As we commemorate International Human Rights Days and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, let us be reminded a quote from Martin Luther King that underlined the importance of the law. I quote, it may be true that the law cannot change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless, end of quote. Excellency, esteemed colleagues, I am delighted to be joined by Dr. Urego, the Vice Minister of Public Health from Colombia, a country that has taken many inspiring steps to enact laws that support sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. We will also hear from Ms. Fatia Kiyange on the effort taking place in Uganda to work with courts to advance maternal health. And I'm pleased that our partner at the Faculty of Legal and Political Science in Tunisia and the University of South Carolina's Institute of Inequalities with whom we are working at the regional and global level to strengthen our know-how and evidence on moving from laws on paper to laws in practice will be speaking today. I would like to express my appreciation to each and every one of you for joining us today to mark the International Human Rights Days. And I thank you for your solidarity with UNFPA in strengthening sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. I thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, DED, uh, for this uh, brief uh, um, word of uh, encouragement, but also for setting the stage uh, regarding uh, the laws and uh, and uh, the, its translation into practice. There have been some very important points that you made, and I want to uh, you know keep in mind you know the eight billion that we have reached a uh, few. Um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, eight billions means that uh, you know we should really uh, look at you know the issue of inequalities because within those eight billion there is so many people that are left behind. Uh, but within these eight billions, of course, you know for us uh, we really need to ensure that we are going to um, you know provide uh, the opportunity, the space, and the capabilities agency for women's girls and all those who are discriminated to uh, really reach their full potential. So thank you so much again. And uh, uh, I would like to now uh, give the floor to Dr. Jaime Urego, 
uh, please, uh, Vice Minister, thank you for joining us and you have the floor and you can speak in Spanish, of course, because you have the translation or in English as you want. Thank you. Okay. Un cordial saludo a todas y todos los asistentes, en particular a la directora ejecutiva, la doctora Natalia Cannes, del Fondo de Poblaciones de las Naciones Unidas. Es un gusto, en eh, calidad de viceministro de Salud Pública y Prestación de Servicios eh, de Colombia, eh, participar de este evento y agradezco la convocatoria y el que haya sido analizado este gap entre la política pública, la normatividad y los avances en la realidad eh, que haya sido incluido en Colombia y que nos arroje eh, estas luces para mejorar nuestra lucha por la garantía de los derechos sexuales y reproductivos de toda la población, en particular de las mujeres. Eh, muy brevemente, Señalar que, como lo evidencia el documento, en el caso colombiano tenemos una robusta legislación y normatividad eh, absolutamente progresiva y progresista en materia del reconocimiento de los derechos sexuales y reproductivos de toda la población, en particular de las mujeres, y en todos los campos. Y coincidimos en que el gap entre esa normatividad basada en derecho y su aplicación termina siendo absolutamente preocupante. ¿Cuáles son las causas de esa distancia? En primer lugar, eh, la grave situación de desigualdad, el conflicto, aunque estamos en una era de construcción de paz, persiste el conflicto armado y una profunda desigualdad social, eso en la base. Y sobre este terreno, eh, un sistema de salud que si bien tiene una cobertura universal dada por afiliación, tiene graves problemas de acceso a los servicios de salud para más del 20%, 20-25% de la población colombiana. Estas barreras de acceso se vuelven particulares para todos aquellos programas y servicios que están ligados a la salud sexual y reproductiva en el marco de un sistema que está basado en la capacidad de pago del ciudadano, de la persona, de la mujer, del joven. En segundo y tercer lugar, encontramos que eh, todavía la matriz ideológica basada en el patriarcado eh, ideologías de género que buscan eh, negar los derechos de las mujeres y que continúan imponiendo estereotipos y que bloquean la autonomía eh, sobre la vida y el cuerpo de los seres humanos, en particular de las mujeres, sigue siendo muy relevante en el país. Este como un tercer elemento. Y un cuarto, de todas maneras, tenemos que señalar la presión eh, de la industria en el caso de la anticoncepción, de los medicamentos antirretrovirales, que todavía no logramos a nivel global, a pesar de tantos esfuerzos, para lograr universalidad de acceso a medicamentos genéricos, etc. Eh, por otro lado, también... La, todavía hay una, una tarea grande en el fortalecimiento de las capacidades del personal de salud y en las estrategias educativas y de comunicación. Frente a esto, los desafíos pues, están dados. El primero, eh, estamos iniciando un gobierno progresista en cabeza del presidente Gustavo Petro, orientado a garantizar los derechos a las personas, a superar la desigualdad y a superar el conflicto armado en la línea de lo que se denomina la paz total. En segundo lugar, estamos impulsando una reforma profunda e integral al sistema de salud para que se respete y se dé la garantía del derecho fundamental a la salud 
sin que medie la capacidad de pago como requisito para acceder al derecho a la salud, a los servicios y programas, en este caso, en aquellos relacionados con la salud sexual y reproductiva. En tercer lugar, seguimos haciendo un trabajo integral desde el sector de salud, desde el sector educativo, desde el sector cultural, con la participación y gracias al impulso de las organizaciones de mujeres, de las organizaciones LGBTQ+, eh, eh, desde los y las jóvenes, para que en Colombia se superen estas eh, situaciones de matriz patriarcal, de machismo y de estereotipos de género que terminan de bloquear ideológica y culturalmente el acceso a estas políticas garantistas que tenemos en el país. Digamos que ahí estamos ubicando nuestros grandes retos y desafíos y a una política de regulación de medicamentos de base regional en donde el acceso con control de precios y calidad permita un acceso universal a todos los eh, dispositivos, medicamentos que tienen que ver con la salud sexual y reproductiva. Básicamente son esos los aportes y agradecemos esta convocatoria a este evento tan importante y a esta pregunta central. ¿Por qué si tenemos normas garantistas de derechos, hay un gap todavía importante para volverlo realidad. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Minister, Vice Minister. Thank you so much for uh, sharing this example uh, from uh, Colombia, but also for giving us hope, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the too strong uh, commitment uh, of the Colombia government to uh, address the, the issue, to improve access and to uh, look at those uh, uh, you know, uh, discriminatory, um, you know, issue that could be really uh, uh, some of the women and girls and other groups, you know, away from uh, the sexual reproductive health services. So we really uh, want to thank the government and, uh, and congratulate him also for uh, the good practices that we have seen over the years in Colombia and that we are using as a UN, you know, to inspire also other member states. So thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to uh, now uh, turn to uh, Dr. Richard Snow, uh, who is uh, the Chief of the Population and Development uh, Branch. Uh, Richard, over to you. Thank you for joining Thank you so much, Nafi, and, and uh, greetings indeed to Dr. Keita and, and also to the Honorable Vice Minister. It's my pleasure to, to provide for everyone just a quick overview of the, the recent data on SDG 5.6.2, which uh, you may be aware, of course, UNFPA is uh, for which the custodian um, and which has wonderfully just become a what they call tier one SDG indicator, which means that the uh, extent, scope, and quality of the data that are being reported are, are of, of the highest levels. So we're very delighted about that. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and, and I wanna just make sure that um, is clear for all. Okay, um, uh, can I affirm, please, uh, that that's visible to everyone? Yes, Richard, we, we are seeing it very well. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So as I said, this is a, a brief presentation on some of the recent results on SDG target uh, 5.6 indicator 5.6.2. Uh, and this is very much about the legal commitments uh, for sexual and reproductive health and rights for all. Okay, and I just want to remind all of us that that the target 5.6 itself, uh, to which this indicator responds, is a target that has 
really a big goal, which is universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights in accordance with the ICPD program of action and the Beijing program platform of action. And it's marked and tracked in the context of the SDGs by two distinct indicators. One of those is 5.6.1, which I won't be sharing or talking about too much today, and the other is 5.6.2. And I just want to remind us all about the complementarity of those two indicators. 5.6.1 is survey data that looks closely at women's ability to make decisions around SRHR in the context of the household. Complementary to that is indicator 5.6.2, which we'll discuss today, which is really the, the number of countries that have laws and regulations that guarantee full and equal access to both women and men age 15 and above to sexual and reproductive health care, information, and education. So the indicator is the number of countries. In fact, I want to be clear that as we report it, it's within the countries that have laws and regulations, the extent to which those laws and regulations guarantee full access. And again, we oversee this particular SDG indicator in partnership with the World Health Organization, with UN Women, and with UN DESA. And the source of data that we used to track and measure this is what's called the inquiry. And this is an inquiry on reproductive health population policy, which is routinely run by the UN POP division with ministries uh, all across the world. Now, SDG indicator 5.6.2 is a complicated indicator. <laughs> we say laws and regulations that are, are designed to affect sexual and reproductive health and rights, and that obviously includes many different components. And, and what the uh, indicator does is it, is it breaks that down into four major sections. One is maternity care, and you see the detail below it. The second is contraception and family planning the extent to which there are laws and regulations assuring people have access to, as you see, contraception, emergency contraception, consent laws around that, et cetera. Then we have one on comprehensive sexuality education and information, and last, HIV and HPV. And again, in all cases, what we're looking at is the extent to which the country has laws and regulations that may, first and foremost, provide universal, guarantee universal access to some any of these services. But some countries also have other regulations or restrictions on who has access to that. And that's part of why this is a little more complicated than, than, than uh, it, it may seem on the surface. But again, we're looking at these four areas. So this is what the world looks like today for, for the countries, the 115 countries across the world that have complete data. Um, and what you see is the overall value is that among the countries, 115 that are reporting, it isn't 76%. So I don't want to be clear that overall value over on the left hand side that you see in, in rose color. It's, it's that of the countries that have laws and regulations, about 76% of the services I just showed you are guaranteed. Okay, so again, this is about the coverage and guarantees within the reporting countries. So you can see fairly quickly, far, far over to the right, the HPV vaccine. It means that of the countries reporting, really only about half of the regulations required to enable that to be a universal service are in place. Likewise, the other low performer, so to speak here, is abortion. So while many, many countries, of course, do have legal abortion, you'll see that there are quite a few restrictions within that. And so it's only about 43% of what we would call universal access is in fact enabled by the current laws and regulations in countries. And again, I think it's notable for all of us, I think that maternity care, life-saving commodities, HIV care and treatment, you can see in contraceptive consent, you can see clearly what are the very positive performing services, so to speak, across the world relative to others. This simply gives you a picture of, of the reporting made possible in the world, okay? And the darker, darker 
rose color that you see on this map are the countries where there is a much greater regulatory and legal system in terms of covering all the different dimensions that I just mentioned and talked about. If you see a black painted country, it simply means there's missing data that they may have reported, but not on every single item. And if there's white country, United States for Greenland, for example, France, I I Spain, these are countries that simply did not report. And, and we pursue those countries uh, as a continuous effort so that we ultimately will have universal reporting. I'm just going to give you a few in-depth looks. Um, this is an example of what we see. So here's the number of countries uh, that have recommended commodities that are not included in the national list of essential medicines. And it's it's interesting what you see here. You know, so this is now uh, the number of countries. When you see female condoms, of the countries that are reporting, 59 of them do not include female condoms in the uh, national list of, of essential medicines. Uh, or other national regulatory authorized lists. Contraceptive implants, also high um, emergency contraception likewise. And, and, and for many of the maternal health um, essential uh, medicines, indeed, we have a much higher coverage across countries, but indeed we still have some countries where essential medicines are still not included. This is the map on abortion laws around the world and the legal grounds on which abortion is currently permitted. Um, and, and yellow dominates, you see a lot of, of yellow, and that is to save a woman's life, um, to preserve uh, a woman's health, uh, indeed in cases of rape, um, and, and in case of, of her impairment. So, so this is important because you see in, in many respects here that red where abortion is prohibited altogether these are, in fact, outlier countries in, in the current uh, landscape of, of 2022 uh, in, in situations uh, um, for, for women in different conditions. Red is full prohibition, and it's really the outlier. But you see quite a dramatic range of, of different um, regulations, prohibitions, um, and, and the diversity is, is really notable across the world. This is now um, the number of countries with any specific type or restriction on accessing contraceptive services, including emergency contraception. And here again, you see blue um, and green. These are countries where there is no, um, um, in, in, no specific restriction. So orange or brown in this case are the countries that have restrictions. Um, and you see that, that on the far left, one of the most common is access to contraceptive services uh, will have a minimum age. So that's regarded as a noted type of restriction. And we have 43 countries where there's an age limitation on who has access to contraception, indeed. Um, and to summarize, um, honestly, we, we are really pleased with, um, among other things, the, the overall positive nature um, of what these laws and regulations show as if there's a kind of indeed a steady movement toward, towards more progressive uh, and enabling conditions for women. Indeed, on the other hand, we, we see quite a number of, of restrictions. So. At present, 72% of the reporting countries have laws, regulations, or national policies that make sexuality education a mandatory component of the national school curriculum. In 22% of the countries where enabling laws for access to contraceptive services exist, still spousal, parental, or some kind of medical authorization is required. And in 28% of the countries where induced abortion is legal on some or all grounds, a husband consent is still required for married women. And finally, in 63% of the countries in the analysis, women can be criminally charged for an illegal abortion. So this is, again, with just a, a quick summary of some of the major, major both points of progress and points of continued restriction and, and work to be undertaken. So indeed, um, I will turn back to the host and thank you so much, Nafi, for the opportunity to share these results. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Rachel uh, Snow. And uh, for everybody, this information and those data are available on the website and of course, uh, the 
team here is always uh, ready to uh, discuss with you any methodological issue uh, that you may, uh, you know, want to, um, you know, uh, to, to get more information on. So thank you so much. So without other ado, we will turn to uh, the, our panelists now. Uh, moving from paper to practice. And um, of course, you have seen that the time is a little bit tight. So we'll try to keep it, uh, you know, uh, with, within the five minutes that is a law. Uh, and uh, to open the conversation, I would like to introduce Dr. Gina Liman. So over to you, uh, Dr. Liman, and thank you so much for joining. You can unmute. Vous pouvez vous euh, ouvrir votre micro. Vous êtes toujours... Euh, euh, OK. Ça I am trying to unmute. Yeah. Voilà, là, ça y est. Merci. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Euh... Alors, je voudrais tout d'abord vous remercier pour l'invitation. Euh... Bon... Euh... Je tiens euh, également à rappeler... Euh que les droits relatifs à la santé sexuelle et reproductive sont des droits humains à part entière et euh, l'action efficace des États pour les protéger et les garantir est impérative et au cours des dernières décennies, des progrès considérables euh, ont été accomplis dans plusieurs pays euh, qui se sont dotés euh, de législations euh, garantissant un accès euh, égal euh, aux soins, soins maternels, y compris la... la euh, donc l'avortement, service de contraception, l'information et l'éducation. Euh, parmi ces expériences pionnières, je cite la Tunisie, dans la loi consacre depuis les années 70 le droit à l'avortement à toutes les femmes de plus de 18 ans dans les limites des trois premiers mois. Au-delà de cette période, une autorisation médicale est requise. Également en Tunisie, depuis les débuts des années 70, il y a un programme de planning familial euh, chapeauté par l'Institut euh, national de planning par, par un office pardon national de planning familial euh, néanmoins, en Tunisie et, et dans plusieurs régions du monde, plusieurs défis euh, entravent encore l'accès complet, égal et effectif à ces droits euh, euh, sexuels et reproductifs. Euh, et là, il y a euh, bon, deux séries de défis. Il y a les défis spécifiques au corpus juridique, euh, notamment euh, avec une, parfois des constitutions qui ne reconnaissent pas explicitement les droits euh, à la santé sexuelle et reproductive, mais font référence à des droits liés comme le droit à la santé ou l'égalité homme-femme ou la protection des libertés individuelles, protection de la vie privée, etc. Euh, parfois euh, et aussi euh, les systèmes juridiques se caractérisent par une, un éclatement du dispositif juridique avec des règles euh, régissant la matière éparpillée euh, dans différentes sources de droit, euh, code pénal, euh, euh, loi régissant la santé, euh, le règlement des circulaires, etc. Euh, il y a également euh, là le problème de contradiction euh, entre ces différents textes et euh, également le risque que les textes d'application euh, ne, ne soient pas euh, promulgués euh, avec une grande latitude euh, laissée au juge au niveau de l'interprétation. Euh, nous constatons également euh, au niveau de, de, toujours du corpus juridique que les, les droits euh, euh, reconnus euh, sont euh, sous souvent soumis à des restrictions comme l'âge, le sexe, l'état matrimonial et l'exigence d'une autorisation d'un tiers. Et ces restrictions, on voit que ces dernières années en, en, en sont de plus en plus, parfois, sont devenues de plus en plus important, en, euh, en particulier pour euh, la restriction à l'accès à l'avortement et à la contraception. Euh, par exemple, il y a euh, des, des législations qui interdisent l'avortement, sauf dans des circonstances exceptionnelles et strictement défini. Euh, à, dans d'autres législations, l'obligation d'obtenir l'autorisation d'un tiers est requise. Euh, la, la soumission de la ligature des 30 euh, euh, à, à la présentation d'un document signé par le mari est parfois euh, exigée. Euh, alors, il y a, les, les difficultés sont 
portent également ou si vous voulez les obstacles sont particulièrement présents dans les systèmes juridiques pluralistes où coexistent les, les, le droit positif et euh, le droit coutumier et religieux. Et je termine avec les défis, si vous voulez, qui sont euh, euh, liés à la mise en œuvre de ce dispositif juridique et qui sont euh, des, des défis euh, euh, budgétaires, de politique publique. Et là, euh, bien évidemment, les ressources financières consacrées par l'État euh, sont relativement limitées, notamment dans le contexte actuel de, de, de crise économique et également avec la montée des courants euh, politiques conservateurs. Euh, nous avons également euh, des problèmes de de l'exercice effectif de ces droits se pose euh, notamment pour des groupes de femmes qui sont euh, confrontés à une discrimination intersectionnelle fondée sur le genre, comme les, les femmes en situation de vulnérabilité, euh, les femmes dans les zones rurales, les adolescentes, les, les handicapés, les, femmes, euh, les, les réfugiés, les, les migrants sans papier. Euh, il y a euh, également un autre défi très euh, très important, qui est l'absence de mécanismes de redevabilité et de transparence des autorités publiques, ce qui entrave l'accès à la justice et à des recours efficaces en cas de violation de ces droits sexuels et reproductifs. Et enfin, euh, l'éducation et la communication restent dans plusieurs contextes nationaux le maillon faible. Euh, en, en effet, bien que plusieurs pays aient établi des programmes d'éducation sexuelle, nombreux euh, sont les, les, les programmes qui ne répondent pas aux standards internationaux et ne produisent pas les changements escomptés au niveau des connaissances sens euh, et euh donc euh, là, pour toutes ces raisons, euh, la vigilance et la mobilisation autour des droits sexuels et reproductifs est toujours d'actualité et toujours nécessaire pour rendre ces droits effectifs et pour ne laisser personne de côté. Et je vous remercie pour votre attention. Merci, merci beaucoup, euh, Madame Liman. Euh, quel plaisir de vous entendre. Et la Tunisie a toujours représenté un exemple pour beaucoup de pays euh, africains dont je suis euh, euh, de ce continent. Et, euh, mais c'est vraiment euh, impressionnant de vous entendre aussi dire qu'il y a quand même des efforts à, 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 à faire. Euh, particulièrement quand il, il s'agit de la population jeune, leur accès aux services, euh, mais aussi donc euh, tout simplement l'éducation sexuelle euh, compréhensible donc euh, à l'école et hors de l'école. Donc, nous vous remercions beaucoup euh, pour ce partage d'informations. Euh, uh, please, colleagues, I would like now to introduce Miss Fatia Kiyangi uh, and uh, Fatia. I hope you're connected. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours for five minutes or so. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nafi, and uh, thank you, Honorable Minister, uh, fellow speakers and colleagues. Thank you for the invitation in this important conversation. I will just share some experiences from Uganda, specifically some of the work that we are doing uh, through the Center for Health, Human Rights and Development. Uh, where we advance, uh, we advance the right to health, focusing on uh, law and policy to ensure that laws that are passed benefit the people. So uh, clearly uh, in Uganda, we have some progressive laws like any other country, but we also have restrictive laws. I'll, only, I'll focus a lot on the laws uh, around maternal health. Uh, the, the challenge with our country and many African countries is that when the laws are passed, there is little investment and effort and attention put into empowering the duty bearers for them to understand their legal obligations. But equally, there is little effort put into empowering the communities and specifically young people to understand their rights around sexual reproductive health. So at, 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 at Sehad, we put a lot of effort in this empowerment, both empowering the duty bearers, but also empowering the communities for, for the communities to be able to uh, hold duty bearers accountable. And we see a positive relationship between duty bearers and the communities because of this kind of legal empowerment and social accountability approach. But I'll move on to uh, the other approach we are using. We are using uh, public interest litigation and I'll focus on just one case, a case we filed in 2011. It is, it, it is a case we filed challenging government 
for failure to provide basic maternal health to the population. And this case was finally uh, decided uh, in August 2020. And we got the landmark constitutional court judgment on maternal health, it's popular record petition, petition 16. Uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, after the release of this, uh, this judgment, we have meaningfully engaged the Minister of Health and we have seen between uh, end of 2020 and now that most of the decisions of the Constitutional Court are being implemented by the government through the Ministry of Health. For instance, uh, we have had the first maternal health audit being implemented within the country, and it's informing policy, it's informing planning, and it's informing quality improvement around maternal health services. We have also seen this particular financial an increase in the budget for maternal health, for maternal health. And also we've seen that uh, a clinical mentorship program has been uh, initiated by government to ensure that healthcare workers are skilled as they provide maternal health services. So uh, what we are observing is that uh, Public, public interest litigation can indeed be used as a tool for transitioning laws from paper to practice. And we've seen positive developments in the country and many people fear to use public interest litigation. But in our case, we have seen it work and we have continued to give government technical assistance to ensure that the, the court decision is implemented. And we, we are seeing a lot of developments in that angle. We have also had a positive court judgment on comprehensive sexuality education. This remains a highly contested issue, but yes, indeed, the courts of law have proved that the, the, the young people have the right to sexuality education. And what remains now is for us to ensure that we, we engage government to implement this court ruling. That is what I can share for now. And, and clearly from our end, I think uh, many uh, fear to go to take governments to court, but indeed for us, it's work for us when it comes to maternal health. And we, are, we have used uh, provisions within the constitution of the country on the right to life, the rights of women, the right to medical treatment, uh, freedom from cruel inhuman treatment are the, really the provisions we use to go to court around maternal health. And we've seen positive developments in the country. Uh, I want to uh, stop at that. Uh, uh, we have many more uh, approaches we are using, but I just wanted to highlight the one on public, public, public interest litigation and how that is helping us to advance uh, the, the, the implementation of SRHR laws and policies in the country. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Fatia, uh, from Uganda. I mean, that was so interesting, really, and uh, I would love really to uh, uh, understand, uh, you know, better uh, this uh, public litigation and how it is working and the tools that you are using. I'm sure that colleagues uh, connected and everybody participant connected here uh, will go on your website to find out more and probably reach out to you by email. So thank you so much for sharing this so important uh, information. And I love this emphasis on empowerment, empowerment of parliamentarians, empowerment of government, empowerment of uh, uh, you know uh, young people and uh, other for social accountability. So we uh, are grateful for. Uh, your generous, uh, you know, information today. Uh, so thank you. And uh, now we will listen to Dr. Laura Ferguson. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, uh, to, just to remind that she's associate. Uh, she's um, uh, sorry. She's from the University of uh, Southern uh, California in the United States, and a strong partner in the research that was recently conducted with UNFPA. So Laura, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nafi, um, and thank you for the invitation to be here and for, for putting this event together. I think it's incredibly important and obviously very, very timely as well. Um, so I think that for a long time, people have recognized the importance of the law to sexual reproductive health and rights, but not really gotten into the nuance. And I think for me, SDG indicator 5.6.2 made a very important step forward by asking not just about the existence of a law that supports SRHR, but also about any common restrictions to it 
and the existence of plural legal systems that might impede its implementation. And that really does help improve our understanding of law and its potential impact. But what's harder to capture quantitatively is the degree to which laws are actually implemented and the extent to which they positively impact people's lives, which ultimately is what we want to do. Um, so uh, after the last round of data on 5.6.2, we did a study in, in four countries to understand what it takes to move good laws on paper to laws in practice. Um, and so we, we uh, worked in Colombia, Malawi, Uruguay, and Zambia, because these are four countries who scored very highly on 5.6.2, and we want to celebrate that. Um, and yet they could also perform better on some of the sexual and reproductive health outcomes. And we wanted to understand why that is and to help chart a roadmap for using good law to improve SRH outcomes. Um, obviously, the specificity of each setting is important, but I'm going to try first to draw some general lessons that I think are broadly applicable um, to thinking about how best we can use good law to improve sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, and I think we need to, to be cognizant that this requires action within government systems and also within communities. So let's start with organizational efforts, primarily within the government. Um, and beyond what an individual law says on paper, we may also want to know as my colleague from Tunisia just highlighted, what other relevant laws and policies exist that either support or contradict this law? What policies and guidelines are in place to help operationalize the law and the extent to which they're being used? What budget has been allocated to and expended on implementing this law? Uh, we also will need to look at the capacity of the health sector, the education sector, the judicial sector, to implement the law, as well as the extent to which these different sectors work together. It'll be important to understand how information on the law is disseminated so that people who are responsible for the provision of SRH services know what they're meant to be doing and that people who may need care also know it's available. Um, the monitoring and accountability mechanisms exist, access to justice, that's another key facet of this um, that we could spend a whole other hour talking about. Um, and finally, political will, and I think the Vice Minister from Colombia really brought this to the fore, that the political will has to exist, and he exemplified it by voicing the commitment to better understanding how to use the positive, the supportive laws that are there um, to imp improve sexual and reproductive health. And I think that's, that's critical. On the other hand, I just wanted to quickly mention a few sociocultural factors that can in affect implementation of a law, recognizing that everything, we all live within this broader uh, sociocultural context. Um, again, inequalities have already been highlighted but we have to understand the law should be equally applicable to everybody. And so even though it's hard to reach some people and it's expensive to reach some people, there is a legal obligation to do that and one that we can't ignore. Um, we also know that religion can play an important role in the support given to implementation of SRH related laws. And there are some excellent examples of working with religious organizations to help promote implementation of these laws. Um, there are, of course, broader gender and cultural norms that still create strong pressures, whether this is about patriarchy and men's decision making, about the value of motherhood, or about sexual taboos, these pressures constrict behaviors, even where the law may be permissive. So again, we need to understand those and think about how we address that. Um, and finally, you know, in, in many countries, there is such cultural and linguistic diversity that the complexity of this just becomes multiplied. And again, there are many examples of, of how to think about that. Um, but I think I'd just like to conclude by saying that traditionally legal advocacy focused on changing the law, uh, which is in places critically important. But now we know this is only the first step. 
once we have a good law in place, we have to continue to work to ensure that it's implemented so that its positive impacts can be felt on the ground. And, and we all have a role to play in that. Um, and SDG indicator 5.6.2 provides an incredibly useful data set to help us identify bad laws and where legal advocacy may be needed, but also critically to see where good laws exist so that we can also focus efforts on how to maximize their positive benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. And uh, thank you again for your great partnership. And I really like, uh, you know, the point that you have made in terms of dissemination. And it comes to also the point that made Uganda in terms of uh, empowerment, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, of uh, those who are making the laws, but also, uh, you know, the, all the political actors and, um, and the people uh, themselves. Uh, so we appreciate your insight today. So the last but not the least, probably the most important normative uh, organization representing CEDAW today, uh, Bandana Rana, uh, please the floor is yours and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nafisa, and thank you to you, UNFPA for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this uh, panel discussion, uh, celebrating the Human Rights Day, uh, you know, uh, on, on translating from paper to practice uh, um, laws related to sexual and reproductive health and rights, not just strengthening laws, implementing laws as well as, well as repealing laws. Uh, I congratulate UNFPA for bringing, about, uh, bringing out this global data uh, which can be a very important um, uh, tool for tracking progress, but also for building accountability uh, and as we engage with different uh, state parties. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as, as many of the panelists have said, you know, there have, there have been important sharings. Laws alone will not work. You know, you might have laws. I'm, I'm quite um, happy to see that 115 countries had data. That's what is reported. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm surprised that some of the developed countries did not report at all. And I wonder why, you know, but uh, to translate from paper to practice, uh, you do need to see how we can relate what, ha what this data has shown uh, and who, which are the best platforms that we can uh, use this as a tool to, uh, as we said, to strengthen or to repeal or even to adopt new laws and policies. And I think the civil society play a very important role. So I think um, the UNFPA uh, has to continue capacitating the civil society, um, you know, in, in order to use this evidence-based data to make states accountable. It has to be used at the national level. It cannot remain on paper alone. So these are some of the platforms. And um, as you know, the high-level commission on the ICPD 25 follow-up has submitted its two reports to the UN, to UNFPA executive director with many suggestions on how, uh, particularly on accessing justice and improving and strengthening justice, and uh, uh, many suggestions and, uh, or recommendations on how this can be, uh, you know, taken further. And I, I think there also this data will be extremely useful. But now coming to the normative standards, as you said, I particularly see uh, this data, um, you know, very useful for CEDAW and not just CEDAW. I also think that we need to. Uh, perhaps UNFP can organize um, a session, you know, during our next session, which is which, which is in February, presenting this data in order to orient the committee members because it 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 provides a very very uh, very valuable resources. Very it reveals a lot of things where we can, as we engage with state parties, you know, CEDA is the legally binding framework, and we we have dialogues, face-to-face -face dialogues with state parties where we can use this data and urge state parties um, um, either to strengthen their laws, uh, if it's not being implemented, why it's not being implemented, the four sectors that you covered, all those four sectors we cover from um, um, contraceptives to family planning, comprehensive sexuality education, maternal mortality, uh, HIV. So everywhere I can see that these data can be used effectively and strengthen state accountability, but perhaps we do need a stronger linkage 
as I always say, uh, between New York and Geneva, and particularly CEDAW as a legally binding framework addressing all forms of discrimination against women and uh, with a lot of focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, for, uh, I mean, I congratulate you NFPA also for coming out with this uh, data, but as I said, two or three indications capacitating civil society to use this data to strengthen accountability um, uh, and, and accountability through the stairs, CEDAW mechanisms would also be very, very important and useful. Um, thank you once again, and I stop here. Thank you. Um, um, thank you so much, Bandana, and uh, always uh, uh, counting on your uh, so important, uh, you know, insight. And of course, we all are uh, today, uh, you know, and uh, of course, every day of our life, you know, agree that uh, uh, there is more to do. Uh, the, the good news is that uh, there is more and more, uh, you know, documentation on how to go about that. You know, the model. Uh, that, uh, you know, have been implemented in uh, this country on another country uh, to be able to move from, uh, you know, the, the, the laws itself to a strong implementation that benefits uh, the uh, rights of uh, women and uh, girls and other groups that are discriminated and in need. So uh, I hope that all of you uh, were really uh, inspired by this wonderful speakers. Uh, I've been myself very, very inspired. So thank you so much for sharing uh, all the panelists, including, you know, our leadership at UNFPA, uh, the, uh, the Jenny Keita, for her, uh, you know, conversation and insight today from the Vice Minister of uh, Colombia and all the countries who have contributed uh, with a lot of experience. Uh, we definitely need to have more experience sharing, more South-South cooperation uh, to uh, put in place. And uh, for UNFPA, this is what we are committed also to do. So your perspective was really unique and uh, we, uh, want to uh, again uh, remember and remind that uh, UNFPA uh, is uh, uh, committed you know to work with uh, you with all of you uh, to uh, make it happen and to make uh, really uh, those rights you know a reality and as I use uh, and I like to use um, because I'm a, a kind of expert in uh, social norms that include laws and policy uh, it's, we, we, we really need to continue and will not rest until human rights become shared social norms. So it's quite important, you know, to uh, walk toward that. And we want to recognize the courage of all the human rights defenders, uh, sometimes at the, you know, uh, very uh, um, aggressive, uh, harass. Uh, by people who are, you know, uh, not seeing it well, but they continue courageously uh, to uh, defend uh, the rights of um, everybody. So I would like to say, like um, uh, Natalia Kanem, our executive director, say, used to say, you know, the march continue. The march continue, and we will continue to really uh, fight uh, for uh, societies that will be, uh, you know, more where social justice will be more uh, permanent and human rights for in sexual and reproductive health uh, will be achieved. So thank you so much for joining today. And this is the end of our discussion. Uh, please let's keep in contact, let's continue to share experience and let's continue to uh, think about, you know, how we can support each other, particularly country that I've expressed here, some so interesting, uh, you know, approaches uh, to uh, translate laws into practices. Uh, so have a wonderful day, wonderful afternoon, wonderful evening, wonderful night for wherever you are. Merci beaucoup à tout le monde and shukran and uh, adios everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.